that's Stephen. <laughs> it occurred to me you and I are, are just about exactly the same age. And uh, oh? so, yeah, so we could, we could conceivably be mistaken for each other. And I was thinking, from my perspective, that would be a cool thing. I would enjoy that. You'd have to be wearing a hat. I Wait, can get you're not one. wearing a hat. No, I'm not. I took you mine were. off. I you was were, wearing, I, we, Stephen and I were wearing similar hats, but I I've took mine off. I've known you for an hour and a half, and, and you yet, were wearing a hat the whole and this, time. And this is the first time you've ever seen me without a hat. It is. I, it's a little shocking. It is. Yeah. Uh, even backstage at BAM, where I met you three months ago, you were wearing, wearing a hat, hat, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You wore hats. I've, I have never, uh, now I've seen you twice, and I've never, I've seen many photographs of you, and you're always wearing a hat. I actually take off the hat just before getting into the shower. Really? <laughs> and um, stand under the spigot. Um, faucet. Faucet, um, keeping my head warm. Right. My head gets very cold very quickly the instant I, I mean, take I mean, off you, my So hat. you're like, you turn on the water, so it's hot water. Yep. You get the water in the right temperature, because yep. we all know that's a process. The water is the correct temperature. You turn on the switch so it comes out of the faucet, and then you Sort of in the manner of Indiana Jones replacing the gold idol with the sandbag, you whip off the hat, get your head under the faucet, so that your head at no point is exposed to the cold air. Correct. So what else do you guys want to know? No, actually, so I, I was about to. I was, yeah, we were uh, having a halfway conversation through an anecdote uh, when we suddenly realized we had to go on stage. Uh, so yesterday I was at a birthday party, and as you do at a birthday party, we played, you know, a game of humiliation. And uh, we were exchanging, everyone was telling the most embarrassing dream that they had had. And for me, I won because I, uh, in college, I took a class in the biopsychology of waking, sleeping, and dreaming where we had to write down our dreams whenever we woke up and, and had a dream. And that's always been pretty easy for me. So uh, I had much wilder dreams than the other people in the class, dependably. Um, but uh, the, the professor, the last time anyone uh, mentioned what their dream had been was when I mentioned what my dream had been. I just sort of read what I had written upon waking up. Um, raped 12-year-old boy up against the wall uh, in a white uh, sari. <laughs> and, like, I don't remember this dream, but I sure remember the reaction of the class. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then... No, you're okay. I, I, and I, then I there thought was the we were going to go in a different party. direction with that, I will confess. I thought that was, I thought we were, that's, yeah, that's a little disturbing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, I mean, it wasn't the most disturbing of the dreams I had during that period. It was just the most disturbing one that you would, would read to a class. Right. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. So, so, what, so you grew up where, exactly? Oh, God. Uh, I was born in Yonkers, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, by the, when I was 23, my mother and I counted the number of places we had lived, mm -hmm. or I had lived, mostly with her, not entirely, um, and we counted 33. So 30, 33, 33 places, places in, 23 in, in 23 years. That almost um, sounds like one of your albums. Sure. Um, my mother was a hippie, so we bounced around a lot. Yeah. Uh, on top of which, I was briefly even an army brat, and we lived in Baden-Baden, Germany. Really? Your mother presumably didn't join the army, but was with somebody who, or did she? She did not join the army. Um, she says she was horribly bored in Baden-Baden because all she had to do was go to dinner parties. And uh, she was particularly humiliated somehow by, uh, they would have raffles at the dinner parties to benefit some local cause. And uh, she would have to have a little um, clothes hang, a clothes, clothes pin, pin yes. uh, on the end of her skirt. And she, being a good beatnik hippie type, thought that was totally degrading. Wait a minute. Why would she have to have a clothes pin on the end of her skirt to hold the To hold skirt? the number of the raffle. Uh, okay. 
Sorry, I so, don't understand. So she's going story. to dinner parties tired. at an army base in Baden Baden, Germany. Yes. And there are raffles at the dinner party. Yes. And the raffle requires you to attach a number to your skirt with a clothespin. So you have to wear a skirt. Aha! <laughs> and this your mother objected to. She was an existentialist. You know, she would, she would, she was reading Sartre, and she wanted to like, dress all in black and be like Audrey Hepburn, only a beatnik, for real. <laughs> um, so yeah, my first language is German. Is it? Yes. Okay. Gut banana. <laughs> is it? Yes. G that means, yes. I presume, good banana. Yes, yes. yes. I have There's no my more... my first words. I, oh, I, really? Yeah. That was the first thing you said? Yeah. Did you rhyme it with something? Not yet. Not yet? That came It's that came a very so long later. second line. So you, uh, if I understand correctly, um, you were being raised by your, a single mother, your mother. Uh, you did not meet your father until you were something like in your 30s? 40s. 40s. And who is last year? Last year. Maybe a year before. Last did you, year. Did, so presumably your, your father. 2013. 2013. And your mother and your father had had some assignation sometime. Presumably. One would think. <laughs> According to the latest science, that was necessary. Yes. What did you know about your father growing up, if anything? He was a barefoot hippie who lived on a houseboat in St. Thomas. And he was. Uh, later in New York, he was managed by Doc Pomas, the uh, songwriter of Why Do Fools Fall in Love right. and This Magic Moment, and um, Save the Last Dance for Me. Um, and the two times that I have met my father have been at screenings that Doc Pomas' daughter, sorry, screenings of a documentary that Doc Pomas' daughter made about her father. Uh, in which my father is a talking head. Right. Did you know who your father was growing up? Did you know his name? Did you know that he was a folk singer out there? Uh, yeah. Eventually, I actually found his records in... Right. Record so you stores. grew up, you knew that your father had this name, he was out there, he was doing stuff, but you had no connection to him. Right. You had no instinct, even when you were a rebellious teenager, presumably, to find him, to berate him, to greet him, to do anything. No. Um, when I was a rebellious teenager, my mother was incredibly easy to rebel against. She's a Tibetan Buddhist who mm -hmm. was raised Catholic. So <laughs> practically anything constituted rebellion. Um, <laughs> believing in the physical universe <laughs> constituted rebellion. It's like knocking on the table, <laughs> exactly. Hey, Ma, <laughs> exactly. matter. That was like peeing on the furniture. Really? Yeah. yeah. Not, <laughs> not passing through the ethereal floor, perhaps. No. Yeah. So, so you didn't have to try that hard. I'm just, I, I guess I'm interested because it, it seems odd to me to grow up, presumably in the era when I grew up, and, and not have a father. That happens to a lot of people, but not express any curiosity, hostility, anything towards him. He just wasn't a, a factor? Well, since I hadn't met him, I didn't have any hostility towards him. Oh, that hasn't stopped all kinds of children. Also, I had plenty of other people to have hostility towards. Oh, I see. <laughs> like, like who? Hmm. At that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, at a certain point, I'm going to bail out and start showing slides. Am. An androgyne from Anchorage, annoyed an anthropologist, and suffered injuries that sent him to the gynecologist. These are from your new book. They are. Which are poems inspired by the list of two-letter words allowable in the official Scrabble dictionary. As of summer 2014. Right. Can you explain how this came to be? Hmm. Uh, so on, on tour in 2012, I was playing Scrabble and Words with Friends with everybody else on tour and with other people in other countries. And I was terrible. Um, and the reason I was terrible was that I couldn't remember the two-letter words. Um, this is an easy one. 
seemingly. But I actually had an episode in fourth grade. You'll permit me a flashback? Fifth grade, actually. A sort of you know, flashback within a flashback. Then flash forward. Um, so I, I was in fifth grade it's taking a test Nolan. of some kind. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was taking a, a test in social studies or something like that. And I was really familiar with the material. I was bored. Um, so my brain said, <laughs> let's ruin Stephen's test. Um, and I forgot how to say in English the indefinite article before a vowel sound. Really? <laughs> I couldn't remember what the second letter was. I remember the first letter. But I went all through the alphabet. like so, and uh, nothing sounded familiar, or they all sounded sort of equally probable. Right. So I had to do the rest of the test without using the indefinite article before a vowel sound, right. which contorted some of my sentences. Right. And so no discussing indeterminate apples, for example. Only collectively. Right. Many indeterminate apples. Right. So but not an individual indeterminate apple. Not an individual indeterminate apple. No. That's a handicap. It was quite a handicap, yes. Right. Um, but it probably started me going on my career. I don't know. Who knows? Um, so let's... You know, oh, by all on. means. Oh. Oh, that puppy sure is cute. Please, can we take him home? The victims of the vampire dog could fill a hefty tome. Um, so as you see, I, I have got Roz Chast to do my illustrating for me. Yay. And, um, Roz Chast is awesome. Yes. Um, so this is her idea of vampire dog. My idea of vampire dog is simply my dog, Irving. Uh, who unfortunately uh, perished during the, uh, the, the galley right. section of the book. Um, so uh, Irving actually looked basically like a bat with a deer's body. A bat with a, a deer's a body? A bat with a deer's body, yes. So he had that kind of rodent-like face, <laughs> ears, yes. like that, but had... As a deer. Right. Yeah. He's that, he was a chihuahua. Right. Yeah. Um, where is this? this I don't know. Yeah, I, I looked at that Jack illustration. Russell yeah. Or, I don't know. Yeah, that's more of a that's more of a big bad wolf. Yeah, say. yeah, yeah. Uh, we should talk about the. I I, I, I want to hear you do the rest of the ones you have, but the the two letter words in, in in Scrabble are words with friends. If you've played the game, you know that you often have vertical letters and horizontal letters, and sometimes these two letter words are so important because they let you fill in corners as you create new words. Right, you need a word, and, and so there's very specific words that if you're a good Scrabble player, you know, even if you don't know what they mean. So you know, for example, like, isn't AA an allowable word? Ah, uh ah, -uh. uh -uh, which is a kind of lava. Right, and this is the sort of thing, and I found this out with my, uh, with playing with the woman who was my wife, that if you, that if you play that, if you playing words with friends of Scrabble and you play ah ah, you know, in the course of making a much larger and high scoring word, and she says, What's that? And you say, It's a kind of lava, it's on the accepted list. That person will hate you even more than they did previously. <laughs> yes. This is why I had to prepare my mother for my book by getting her hooked on words with friends right. just before the book came out so that she would understand the necessity for the two-letter words and not think that I was just some moron. <laughs> Making them up. But what's interesting is a lot of people use these words. They know the list. Yeah, yeah. If you read Stefan Fatsis' book about competitive Scrabble players, they don't know what the words mean. They just know they're allowed. Your poems are based on their actual meaning, so it's a public service. Right, because I can't remember how the... I can't remember all these words. Um, I have a terrible memory. And so I had to write this book in order 
to remember them. Uh, and there's, unfortunately for me, uh, a new edition of the Scrabble Dictionary mm. that, that uh, it's got four new two-letter words in it. Um, but only people who have the new Scrabble Dictionary, who have bought the Scrabble Dictionary, can play them. Oh, I see, because the rest of the world doesn't know about them. Right. Um, uh, but, but also because when you play Scrabble, you have to agree on which book you're going to use as a reference, which means that you have to have a physical copy of the book. Right. So it doesn't do to just say, oh, I've heard that in the new edition there's four more two-letter words. You have to be able to show. Uh, so until everyone in the world has the new edition of the Scrabble Dictionary, I'm You're safe. I'm safe. Yes. Um, could you read a couple more and then we can talk about how you put together the book? Sure. I. What all in favor say is I, while those again say nay. But those in thrall to vampire dogs say, I hear and obey. A sense of theme. Yes, yes. <laughs> there are three major themes, four major themes if you count Scotland. <laughs> um, what are these themes? Vampire dogs, uh, gender silliness, maybe Scotland is the third theme. Okay, let's go on, to the, let's see if we encounter what are the other themes. Nope, wrong way. That's traditional in slideshows. <laughs> bi. Here we have the gender silliness. The bi orientation is the happiest of all. If only they could bottle it and sell it at the mall. <laughs> Another Roz Chast masterpiece. You have to like that one. Mm. How did you come to write these things? Were you, were you like studying the list to play words with friends with your mother? And then you started, did, did you say, I need a mnemonic? Were you thinking to yourself, oh, these would make a, a amusing little poem? Well, not my mother. I, I, I would never have been able to get my mother to start playing words with friends if she didn't know that I had a book coming out that required her to be playing this game. She's not a frivolous person. She's a, Tibetan Buddhist who was raised Catholic. <laughs> that requires commitment, discipline. It, it's, it's, it's like being a mortician who was raised Quaker. <laughs> Why would a mortician who was raised Quaker have any unusual or untoward difficulties in being a mortician? No music. No music? No music. A funeral home without music. Anyway. Oh. I was, thinking more, I was thinking more of the embalming process, oh, which well, I thought a Quaker that. would be able to handle as well as anybody. I think so, too. All right, let's move on. Duh. Duh means of or from in names like Cruella de Vil. It's fun to use in drag name games, to wit, Ova de Hill. <laughs> Uh, this is also not a portrait of my dog Irving. Um, my dog Irving would never have been caught dead in a yellow bow. It looks more like my, my new dog, actually. You got, you got a new dog, because Irving I died. Did, yeah. What did you get? Another chihuahua. You like chihuahuas? Um, I travel a lot, and mm -hmm. sometimes I need to travel with my dog, and it makes sense to be able to travel with my dog at my feet, mm -hmm. under the you do that. Me? Have you looked into um, getting the dog certified as a service dog? Because I've been thinking about doing that. Because I've you've seen it. I've seen it. Working chihuahuas, little floofy Shih Tzus with bows in their hair that have little things saying, "I'm I'm at work. Do not pet me." <laughs> and I'm considering going to that. Going to that. Have you thought about that? I don't have the personality for that. What? I mean, I can say, this is my service dog. <laughs> you believe me. 
but it's not necessarily going to work. Yeah. You need to have that Alec Guinness. Alec thing. Guinness? Yeah, as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was like going to mm-hmm. Lavender Hill but you mean like he'd be like, this is the service dog you're looking for. Exactly. And then they would. Yes. Uh, or Daniel Day-Lewis is in uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. You do not see. Daniel Day-Lewis is not, is he in Bram Stoker's Dracula? Daniel no, that's, that's uh, Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. Right. Yeah, I, I, always get, <laughs> I always get them mixed up. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So many people do. Yes. Um, so. It was because uh, uh, in the, uh, the, um, the unbearable lightness, lightness of, of being, being uh, I, I still can't remember which one it was. That was Daniel Day Lewis. Okay, well, yeah. I think he was a vampire in Prague. No, that was different. Did you sit down and say to yourself, "I am as a as a as a writer's task, I am going to write a poem for all of the two-letter words," because not as a writer's task, as a uh, player of Scrabble on words with friends, who needed a mnemonic device. Uh, because I, I started out with, like, how, how, the, how the heck am I going to remember ah ah? Well, I guess I could look it up. Yeah, okay, ah ah, ah ah, it's lava. How can I remember that? Well, how many kinds of lava are there? Oh, look, there's two. Oh, the other one's called the hoey hoey. Oh, I could make that rhyme. Oh. Uh, the, the reason I ask is because uh, I first encountered uh, your music, The Magnetic Fields, when the friend of mine gave me uh, your album, I, right? mm-hmm. which is a series of songs, 16 or so. We like to call it I. I. Because <laughs> it's the lowercase I. I. So he gave me the album I. I said, what's that? He said, I. Mm-hmm. And it's 16 or so songs, all of which begin with the letter I. I do this, I believe I like this. And then there's 69 love songs. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if you are setting yourselves tasks, like I'm going to write a record in which all the songs begin with the letter I. And now we have this, in which you've written poems for all the two letter words in Scrabble. And and what I see is a kind of formalistic mind working going, hmm, it would be very interesting to attempt that challenge. Am I completely wrong? Well, more of that. Yeah, more of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, I I, I like challenges. My nightmare is being in a blues band (laughs) and having to do the same thing over and over again for 70 years. (laughs) Really? Yes, I prefer to, you know, come up with my own constraints. Right, and so, I mean, I remember once seeing uh, Robert Wilson many, many, many years ago, the stage director, and he has just done this thing, The Civil Wars, which was this enormous, sprawling, surrealistic theater thing. And he was explaining, we all showed up at this auditorium to hear him explain it. And he said, I wanted to do something in five parts. And he drew five boxes. And then he said, and I wanted to do things between the five parts. So he drew little boxes. And then I decided to, and so pretty soon he had some boxes. And that was it. That was really all it started. And sometimes I I think, I mean, because your lyrics and your songs are sometimes so meaningful and, and funny and odd and surprising. I mean, does it start from, I have deep thoughts that I must write down? Or does it sound like this is a challenge? This is a lyricist's challenge, a poet's challenge, a language challenge. Where do you start from? Uh, when I thought of 69 Love Songs, I was actually trying to design a poster. 69 Love Songs? Yeah, I, I, I thought, now, I really like that Sweeney Todd poster. Uh, Sweeney the Todd. Caricatures, Tenniel esque character. Yeah, this is from the of Lens Sondheim, Carreau and Angela Lansbury. <coughs> Angela Lansbury and little figures uh, waving knives and um, baking pins. Yes. Um, so I, I, that that's a great poster. Mm-hmm. It really tells you about the fun part of why you would want to see Sweeney Todd because she is like the mad queen. The, yeah. the, you know, she's like the red queen in, in Alice. Um, and I was sitting in uh, the townhouse, which is a Tony gay bar in midtown Manhattan, where they don't let you wear a hat now. So I haven't been there in years. Um, <laughs> and 
they were, I think, playing a Sondheim medley or something, and everything was going well. And I thought, now, making a poster, you want something really big, like the number 100. Um, maybe I do a, a review of like four drag queens sing 100 songs. Um, so the, just it was the 100 zero zero was the first thing that I thought of. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that would be like five hours long, maybe something shorter. Um, <laughs> What's a nice number, 86? Yeah, they could be in a restaurant, it could be 86. No, that's stupid. Um, now 69, 69 love songs. Oh, oh wait, that's a good idea. Uh, so having decided it was a good idea, I um, immediately decided to do it on the spot. Um, but actually, I think I wrote in my notebook, I hereby swear to do this. Uh, you know, because I didn't want to forget. Um, so, yeah, that came from a, a graphic design idea. Um, did you ever get your poster? I mean, does the cover of the album, which is the big number 69, at least for these on my iPod. Yeah, um, right, and the, the good thing about 69 is it's, you can make an even larger number out of it because it's two digits instead of, one, instead of three. Oh, I see, so you can actually make the numbers bigger. Yeah, um, and also it's a palindrome. Yes. And also, it's slightly dirty. Was that part of the? Yeah. Well, that it's that's part of it being a palindrome. Yes. You see, it's a meta <laughs> meta palindrome. <laughs> so, um, so so is 101. At least the number 101, um, uh, which is even dirtier if you <clears throat> take it that way. Anyway. Yes, let's have another poem. Yeah. <laughs> X. Sometimes one feels frisky and one wants to sex one's ex. Best to try it first with a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> I like to think that the woman in the bed looks quite a lot like Roz Chast. It does, actually. Yeah. Roz Chast. Like Roz cartoonist. Chast, my cartoonist. Cartoonist. Illustrator, illustrator. Uh, one more. Yes. He. Pa's a he, and Ma's a she, and Trevor is a tranny. <laughs> We're not sure what to call him now. We used to call him Granny. <laughs> You know, Roz Chast has had a long and distinguished career, primarily as a cartoonist of The New Yorker, of course. I bet that's the first time she's drawn a transsexual sailor. You think? I would bet. Um, You'd be I, more ran into, with uh, I, I ran into her in the pages of Nature magazine a few weeks ago, where she was drawing something so esoteric. It was a, about some aspect of sequencing the tsetse fly genome or something. Um, and it was so esoteric that I was surprised that Roz had taken the trouble to figure out what they were talking about. Um, but it, she did several different cartoons for this abstruse topic. I am perfectly willing to believe that Roz Chask routinely draws illustrations of advanced genomics. Trans mm. Transsexuals? Well, I bet she's, uh, you know, she was, she probably came up drawing for Christopher Street or Possibly, you know. possibly. Well, Village I, Voice would have asked. When you were growing up, who were you listening to? Were you a, were you a Broadway guy? Were you, uh, were you listening to, you've, you've said your favorite band in the world is ABBA. Mm -hmm. And that, that remains true? Yeah, yeah. Who else is there? <laughs> um, the, I, part of, Part, part of the appeal of ABBA is that since they stopped in 1981 two, um, they remained innocent of much that went later. Right. They didn't have a trip hop phase. Um, 
they didn't put in a little bit of dubstep just to make the kids happy. Right. Uh, they never went emo. They didn't go reggaeton. Yeah. Um, although they did do their version of reggae. Uh, so, yeah, I, I like how a great deal. How did we get on this topic? Well, I'm, I'm curious because I'm, I'm trying to figure out for my own satisfaction, like, what was the inputs into you as you were growing up and listening and learning music and writing lyrics that has at least led to the remarkable output that you've been given us for the last 20 years or so? Uh, oh, thank you. Um, um, Bubblegum pop, really, mostly. Um, I liked, when I was 11, I liked ABBA and the Bay City Rollers. Oh, sure. And Sweet, which tells you when I was 11. Yeah. Um, and I still do. With the Bay City Rollers, I, I generally prefer the original versions to their covers, mm -hmm. but they had some really quite good uh, originals as well. Right. Like Rock and Roll Love Letter is written for them. And, 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 and what was appealing to you about them? And what remains the appeal? You know, because I liked music too when I was lap music too when I was a kid, but I don't like it very much now, and I certainly never became a musician. Hmm. I mean, now I listen to well, you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which strikes me, and maybe I'm just not sophisticated enough to see it. But well, it's but when you very listen different. to me, you are listening to the Bay City Rollers, and that's where I lose you. Ah, yeah, yeah. Because when I listen to you, I hear these very complex songs, both musically and lyrically. With a, with a level of irony to them sometimes. I mean, what is the lyric in a book of love? Like, the book of love is really stupid. Um, <laughs> and and I, don't, I didn't get that from the Bay City Rollers. The Bay City Rollers are, I think we can all agree, unironic in their approach. <laughs> the lead singer was convicted of assaulting his girlfriend with an air gun. Oh, now I get it. <laughs> well, be that as it may, and certainly, I grant you, air gun assault gives you indie cred. But, <laughs> but I, I, I'm just, I'm, I again, mean, I, I'm not trying without to... Without it, we wouldn't have a William Burroughs, right? You know, you had to I don't go know through if, the experience. That's true. I don't know if anybody is in ever to... intellectually or aesthetically linked the Bay City Rollers and William Burroughs <laughs> because they both shot their girlfriends. But... I'm There's willing to go there. Forever. No, I think it's awesome. But I, I, I mean, I would have guessed, uh, particularly because you mentioned Sweeney Todd a little bit, that you must have grown up listening to Sondheim, because I find a lot of theatricality in your music. You recently did the musical for Coraline, the adaptation of the Neil Gaiman book. Um, and there's character in your music. There's voice in your music, not you know, in the sense of like, here is a character speaking of a very specific experience. And that, to me, is, is uh, uh, from the theater. It's from the musical theater. Sure, but um, my musical theater listening experience was almost entirely in adulthood. Uh, when, when I lived in Hawaii when I was eight, we had the only piece of music we had at all was one cassette of the Godspell cast album. Yes! Um, which I now can't really listen to. Really? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I get maybe a third of the way through Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord, and I have to turn it off. Really? I should explain that Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord is the same thing again and again about 120 times. <laughs> and that thing is the one line, Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord. And um, as a militant atheist, this is not persuasive to me. <laughs> the only Lord that I'm thinking of preparing the way for is Cthulhu. All hail Lord Cthulhu. Yes. Um, you have a ukulele there. Oh, yes. We were, we were talking earlier about, or an ook, as everybody's calling it around here. You, you lived in Hawaii, so you call it an ook. I call it a uke. Oh, okay. I call it a ukulele. I don't say uke. All right. And, and, what, and, and you told me that you had to the, the ukulele because people often asked you why you didn't write these poems as songs. Right. And you thought you'd demonstrate I'll now why. demonstrate. OK. Uh, maybe I'll do it with the next one. Uh, oh, wrong way, I guess. OK. Not funny. 
Markets blame for everything like every other mom. Pa, meanwhile, is on a pub crawl skanking to the sky. As opposed to, <clears throat> Ma gets blamed for everything, like every other Ma. Pa, meanwhile, is on a pub crawl, skinking to the ska. <laughs> and we have an illustration. You can't really have an, uh, you That's don't true. traditionally have an illustration. What's interesting to me is that, is that it, you, it seems as if playing it as a song necessarily made it sad. Isn't there the possibility that you could play it as a happy song? Uh, yes, there would be the, the usual ABBA technique of having uh, sad lyrics with a, uh, a less than sad melody. Right. Um, you want a demonstration of that? Oh, yes. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll do it with the next. I should preface this one uh, with explaining that my drag name that I don't get to use very often uh, is Violencia Domestica. <laughs> so the poem is, Ow, says Pa, as Ma jumps up and down upon his head. Take one deep breath and count to, ow, is it something I said? But musically, ow says pa as ma jumps up and down upon his head. Take one deep breath and count to, ow. Is it something I said? <laughs> I'm glad no one is videoing or recording this. Oh no, no one is videoing or recording any of this. <laughs> um, I get to ask you, I think I have time to ask you one more question before we open up the audience. Um, you have done so much, you have done numerous albums with numerous bands, you have scored films, you have written at least one that I know of off-Broadway show. You have done a number of operas, theatrical things. You've, 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 you've collaborated with Lemony Snicket, which is the dream of so many of us, and you have achieved it. Uh, is there something that you really want to do, or have really wanted to do, that you haven't done yet? Oh, and then I should have said, now, of course, you've written a charming book of poems, funny and amusing in the manner of, say, an Edward Gorey or an Ogden Nash, which is no small thing. So what's next? What's the thing that's like, ah, oh, but I really wish I could have done this? Well, I, I suppose book-wise, I still should write the Great American Verse Novel. Do you, do you like? Yes. Do you know, the, do you know uh, the, that, um, the Golden Gate by Vikram Sait? I do. I love that book. And um, I apologize so dearly for uh, forgetting his name. David Rakoff, of course, before he died, wrote a novel in verse, which I haven't read. You know, I haven't read that one either. Yeah. I but have it at home, but I haven't read it. Yeah. I had a... Bug scare. Oh, um, two years ago. Now I, I, I had to put every book I had in boxes, shrink wrapped, mm -hmm. in the garage, and uh, gradually, once every two weeks, take a shrink wrapped box of books out and put it in my serial killer style freezer chest. Um, and then I, is that what I they're called? A, like serial killer freezers? Uh, I think it's abbreviated SKS. Okay. But yes. A, um, and I would thaw one book every one uh, box of books every two weeks, so all of the books in my house are uh, in no order whatsoever. Right. So I have no idea. Lulu knows where the David Rakoff book is. And he's not telling us until the Great Awakening and the Doom of All Humanity. Nope. No. 
I think at this point, with that note, we'll open it up to your questions for Mr. Stephen Merritt. And people are coming through the audience with microphones. And while they do that, I will read Ox. Trixie was the ox princess. She ruled the happy oxen until a rival dosed her with a nasty neurotoxin. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, sure. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a quick question. Were you ever tempted to title the book All My Little Words? Um, no. But <laughs> when I went to the New Yorker office to be uh, interviewed, the, the writer said, now I wanted to make sure that I interview you early on in this process because I know that someone else is going to think of this before I do, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to title the article All My Little Words. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It went really well. Uh, in fact, the New Yorker piece was almost entirely a Roz Chast interview, which was fine because she also has another book out, which uh, is wonderful. Um, it's called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And it's a memoir of her parents' decline and eventual death, the end. Yeah. Um, but it's very it's funny great. and yeah. informative and uh, discusses things that we don't ordinarily get to learn about, like incontinence. You want to read this one? Pa. Pa paused Paolo from Paducah sometime in the Louvre. Ma paused with Neil and I she rescued from the zoo. I should explain that earlier in the book, we have met the eye, a uh, threatened three-toed sloth found only in Brazil. And uh, so we already know which one is the eye. <laughs> I, I love that that is Roz Chast's depiction of rough trade. <laughs> <laughs> which, Further, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Further, I like that you dragged her out of her comfort zone, and I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. She appreciates that, too. Further questions? I had a question about the bed bugs. Bed bugs, yes. Yes, were you able to get rid of the bed bugs by cold, oh. by freezing, because I also had bed bugs. And we had to heat up the house to 121 degrees to get rid of them all. Really? You had to turn up the heat to? No, well, you, had to have, you have to have a company come in. You can't turn up your own heat that way. <laughs> they have to bring in many heaters. And, and I highly recommend it if anyone does get bed bugs. Because it works, and no, there's no toxic chemical. Oh. Did it like? It's did embarrassing. It, but did it like bake your books? Uh, we had to do what he well he was describing. We had to take our records out of oh. the house and put them in the garage because they would have melted. Uh -huh. We had to get put a lot of things in the refrigerator so they wouldn't melt. Sure. Well, and still some things got destroyed. Steve, but the bed bugs were gone. They're still gone. Are are your bed bugs gone? Uh, yeah. But for me, the issue was the eggs. And uh, you could freeze the eggs uh, for two weeks, and they're no longer viable. Uh, but the, then I still had all these books in the garage, uh, which I kept for two years. Uh, I still had, I think, seven boxes of books by the end of my thawing one every fortnight. Um, <laughs> Because I have a lot of books, and I guess that's 104 boxes plus seven. I guess I have 111 boxes of books, um, except for the ones that I bought during those two years. <laughs> Did you have to freeze all of them? <laughs> Not the ones I bought during the two years. I understand. Um, yeah, I had to freeze but, all of them. But the bed bugs are done. That was the question. Yes, yes. Um, okay. uh, I, I had them in my studio apartment in New York, so uh, basically I just had people come in and do it for me. Um, and the only thing that they couldn't do was the books. So uh, there were three bombings of my apartment with the most toxic 
chemicals conceivable. Uh, I asked for it to be defoliated um, as though in some country filled with people you don't like. <laughs> um, one more. All right, a little more. A, a, a little more than one more. Up! Up from an unhallowed grave, the vampire dog arises. Now Chihuahua, now Great Dane, a master of disguises. <laughs> that looks more like Irving. What, what can you tell? Yeah, he looks better. Does yeah. the vampire dog appear as a puppy to most people? So as to fool them into... Well, yes. 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 Hence, oh, that puppy sure is cute. It's like there was a horror movie five years ago or something about um, uh, an adopted child from Russia who they think is a nine-year-old girl, but she's a 28-year-old woman, uh, it turns out, with the... Uh, with the sexual appetites of a 28-year-old woman and not a nine-year-old girl. Isn't that terrible? So it's a horror movie. Um, but it's actually, it's actually a family drama, but it's scored like a horror movie, so you think it's a horror movie. But that's, I, yes. yes. So the vampire dog, does the vampire dog bite you and suck your blood in the traditional vampire method? And if so, do you then become a vampire human or a vampire dog? You become a servant of the vampire dog. Oh. You become Renfield. Right. <laughs> Character from Dracula. And the Renfield, and so you, you must do the dog's bidding. Yes. Yeah. Does, presumably the dog would say things like sit, fetch, stay, leave you alone in the house while it goes off to work, just as a sense Treats. of vengeance. Yes. <laughs> Further questions? You've lived quite a few places. Um, are there any particular parts of the country or, or world that you found challenging? And if so, what did you learn from it? I find them all challenging. What do you mean? <laughs> Particularly challenging. Um, well, LA was particularly challenging. I'm a New Yorker. I lived there for six years, and, and people still thought I was making fun of them. You weren't? <laughs> Were you out there trying to pursue the music business? Uh, I was out there for elbow room space. You know, I had a, a whole house for the first time, yeah. um, which I quickly outgrew. <clears throat> I have a recording studio. They grow like the Pillsbury Doughboy <laughs> or Pillsbury cookie thing. What are they called? Yeah, the Pillsbury Doughboy is, I think, static in size. Yeah. However, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but what the Pillsbury the, Doughboy the, represents, the, yeah, the sort of inflatable food. Yeah, if you're of a generation, one of your earliest images is those time-lapse photography of those Pillsbury biscuits going whoosh in the oven. It's a little, it's a little terrifying if you're it's six. A gross. You're little, yeah, oh, right, yeah, gross. Yeah. Like, speaking of horror movies. So I can yeah. see why you would imagine that would be the horrific metaphor for your life going out of control in yeah. Los Angeles. Yes. Right. So L.A., don't go to L.A. and... Well, no, it's, it, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. There are several interesting people. Um, <laughs> scattered about. Um, One more. Us. Us is me and Gus driving our bus across the land. When we die, just bury us together, hand in hand. Oh. That's terrifying that that's the sweetest one we've seen. <laughs> and they're dead. Yes, uh, now you'll notice that Roz Chast has made them a gay male couple, which is actually not in the text. Um, she was taking poetic license. Uh, I, I didn't give them gender. I wonder who the Gus has an implied gender. But who's, who's the couple in the picture? They're them. Me and Gus. Oh, I see. As younger, uh, non-dead people. people. Okay. <laughs> so she sort of made it a little sweeter then. That's oh, nice. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's only one more, yeah. Right. Za. So, Ma and Pa pick at their Za 
with faces grim and stony. Ma munches on the crunchy crust, and Pa the pepperoni. <laughs> There's also some gender, in gender criticism there, I think. There's some subtle implications. Pa is eating a phallic sausage, and <laughs> Ma is a vegetarian. I didn't think I'd have to explain that to a man who found the number 101 erotic. Yep. <laughs> I still don't know oh, what that was about. It's got a hole in the middle. Oh. <laughs> OK. So we have time for a couple more questions. So um, what about Lee? What about what? What about Lee? What about Lee? L-I. Oh, L-I. Uh, I only have 16 slides. <laughs> which is a good segue to say that all of the two-letter words are in the book, which is available for sale outside, and Stephen will be, in fact, signing those books momentarily. So do you, do you know the poem for Lee off the top of your head? Should I run and get my copy? Um, oh, please. <laughs> uh, oh, please. Uh, please, no Chinese water torture. I confess it freely. One li is like 0.3 miles. A mile is roughly three li. <laughs> Stephen Merritt, ladies and gentlemen. Is there, we have one more person? One more person, I think. Go ahead. Uh, obviously, words are very important in your life, but between your collaboration... They're very important in everyone's life. <laughs> between the collaboration with Roz Chast and your association with Neil Gaiman, were any of the books you bought in the last two years graphic novels or anything non-word specific? Were any of the books I bought in the last two years not graphic novels? Or, or were they graphic novels? Are you Something that comics, was not graphic just novels? Words. That, uh, level, that level of um, Actually, my, uh, I'm currently uh, I'm flying around. So uh, I, I'm on this project this year of reading all of the novellas in the Melville House, The Art of the Novella series. So I have a, a, inch, uh, a foot and a half thick bookcase of uh, little paperback novellas. Four of which are called the duel for some reason. I guess a, a, a duel is something. Four of mine are called the duel. Is there another one? That, uh, hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm missing four or five of them. I, I bought the complete set, but they didn't actually mail me all of them. So uh, I only got four of the duel, for example. Um, uh, so yeah, um, words are important to me. I read all the time. Music is what I do to afford more books. <laughs> I think that's a very good way to leave it. So you will be signing your book outside, and tomorrow night you're at the Old Town School. You're doing a solo concert. You are playing, as I read, from your back catalog quite considerably. Yes, my back catalog and my current catalog and the rest of it. Right. Uh, me and a metronome. A metronome? <laughs> yeah. It would just be you and a it's metronome. It's a simple sort of robot. Right. <laughs> Stephen Merritt and his simple sort of robot will be there tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.